Well, church, please turn with me in God's word to the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 23. We have today and simply one more Sunday in the book of Joshua. Now, next Sunday, my friend Rusty Thomas will be preaching, so I will finish the book of Joshua in two Sundays from now. However, as we come to this Sunday's text in Joshua 23, it is a really important one. I've entitled the sermon this morning, Don't Take God's Grace for Granted. Don't Take God's Grace for Granted. And one of the things that I noticed uh, this morning in Sunday school as we were in another text where Solomon is praying at the dedication of the temple is I realize that there are many places throughout the Old and New Testament where we have a passage like this one. A passage that reminds us of how good and gracious and merciful God is to us, how kind He is to us, and yet God also reminds us, don't take my grace for granted. As a good mother or father would say to their child, they'll say, son, daughter, I love you, but don't you play with me, right? I love you, and I also know how to discipline you. Because I love you, I will not let you get away with just anything. And so we see this is one of many passages in Scripture which reminds us of how good God is and how much He loves us and how we better not play games with Him or He will humble us quickly. Don't take God's grace for granted. We read in Joshua chapter 23, the prophet at the end of his life giving some final words to the nation. And he does this in chapters 23 and 24. And so as Joshua is giving these final instructions to the nation, we read in chapter 23, verse 1, a long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies... And Joshua was old and well advanced in years. Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and heads, its judges and officials and and officers, and he said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years. In other words, Joshua is saying, I know I'm near the end of my life. I know that these are some of the final words that I will be able to share with you. Verse 3. And you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Verse 3 is so important. He reminds the people, God has dispossessed the nations who used to live in the land of Canaan. The reason they were defeated is because your God fought for you. The reason you have what you have today is because God has given it to you. The blessings that you enjoy are the very gracious merciful hand of Almighty God. You did not earn these things by your own power and strength. You did not earn them at all, but God gave them to you because He is kind and He is good. And notice who Joshua focuses his message on in verse 2. To the elders and the heads, the judges and the officers, to the leaders of the nation. He wants the whole nation to understand the message, but especially the leaders should understand that it is God who has blessed them so. Oh, how I wish 
the leaders in the United States of America would understand this truth. That the reasons that we have so many freedoms and so many blessings in this land is because they've been provided to us by the almighty hand of God. And no nation will survive mocking the creator of the heavens and the earth. If Israel, God's chosen people, were not exempt from this reality, then what of the United States of America? Because I'm going to tell you something. God had one chosen nation, Israel. Now, has God uniquely blessed the United States of America? Yes, he has. But we are not God's chosen nation the way that Israel was under the old covenant. And we need to understand something. If God would bring judgment upon Israel, then what do you think he'll do to the United States of America if we do not repent and seek his face and turn back to him? Not only is that true of our nation, that is true of our local church. We, over the past few months, have been experiencing the the great blessings of God. But don't you think that all that we have seen could not be erased in a moment if we were to turn away from our God and take Him for granted? If we would allow sin to creep in? This is one of the reasons why we saw last week the the, the delicate unity of God's people and how precious it is. Church, we have to stick together. We have to be vigilant. We have to understand that even in the midst of blessing, if we turn from God's way from to the right or to the left, if we take our God for granted, He can remove His hand of blessing. So we must seek Him. We must be faithful to Him. We cannot take Him for granted. This truth also applies in our own homes, in your marriage, and with your children, and with your family members, and those whom you are closest to. I think one of the most difficult things that I've ever had to do in ministry is to bury someone who has died a very untimely death, even a child. And though such a thing is unspeakably painful... I do want to say this. It should serve as a humbling reminder to us that our days on this earth are not guaranteed. Now don't misunderstand me. God has numbered our days. We cannot add to or take away from them, Job tells us. But don't just assume that you're going to live to 80, 90, 100 years old. You do not know that. You do not know that for yourself and you do not know that for your children. I'm not trying to scare you. But we need to have a healthy fear of God and be humble enough to realize, I don't know what's coming around the corner. None of us are guaranteed our health. None of us are guaranteed our jobs, our income. We need to understand that tragedy could befall any one of us. That's one of the things that was so beautiful about this weekend, was it not? That when a family in our church faced such a difficult circumstance, we were there for them and we were able to really help them. And praise God, that is 
That is one of the most beautiful things about the local church is how we love one another and we're there for one another. But it also is a humbling reminder. Listen, any one of us could have had COVID and needed a double lung transplant. Some got very sick, others did not. We can't really explain why. We, we don't fully understand that, but it, it could have been any one of us. And not only could it have been any one of us, it might be any one of us in the future. And once again, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to make you realize our lives are fragile. Our marriages are important. Don't take your husband or your wife for granted. If you are married, that is the most important human relationship. Apart from your relationship with Jesus Christ, that is your most important relationship that you will ever have. You better protect and you better preserve and you better fight for your marriage. Your children. Not only are their lives fragile, but their souls are too. And so many times we see even Christian people feeding their children, spiritually speaking, to the wolves. Allowing a secular, godless culture to infect their hearts and their minds and teach them all kinds of ungodly, unspeakable lies. When it's our responsibility, moms and dads, to teach them the truth. Not only is this true in your family, but it's true for you in your life. You have a good job. That is a blessing from God. But companies go bankrupt. People can be disabled. You could find out you have an illness tomorrow and it could change everything. Do you feel that? Do you understand that your future is in the hand of God? Once again, I'm not trying to scare you. But you need to not take God's grace for granted. That should affect how you pray. That should affect how you read your Bible. That should affect how you love your wife and your children. That should affect how you speak to your neighbor. That should affect the decision that you make on Sunday morning of whether or not to get up, get ready, and go to church. It should affect whether or not you share the gospel of Jesus Christ with your neighbor because you do not know if your neighbor will be there for you to tell them about Jesus tomorrow. Joshua here gathers the nation and he says, look, I'm old and advanced in years and I've learned a few things in my years. Number one, God is good. Number two, don't take him for granted. He said in verse 3, it's the Lord your God who fought for you. Everything you have, every blessing you have experienced and are experienced, experiencing and will ever experience in the future, these blessings are given to you by the sovereign hand of Almighty God. Verse 4, Joshua says, Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I've already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. Now, understand what he's saying. Not only has he given you the land, he says that in the land that you've been given, there are some nations that remain. Not all of the pagan peoples had yet been driven out of the land of Canaan. Many had, but not all had. If you just read on in Judges 
and in First and Second Samuel, you'll see that the Philistines and others still were in the land after Joshua's time. That, after all, is where Goliath, this giant, comes from. He's this giant of Gath from the Philistines. And so, we see here... Joshua saying, I've given you these lands and you still have work to do. There are nations that yet remain. One of the ways that you don't take God's grace for granted is by not sitting on your butt, spiritually speaking, and not doing things for God's kingdom. How many of us can honestly say that we are living with all that we have for the kingdom of Christ. Listen, apathy, spiritual laziness is default mode for all of us. One of the things that God told Adam when he cursed him in the garden after he sinned, he told Adam that that, that he would struggle to be a leader. And then he told Eve that she would want to subvert Adam's role as the leader. One, one of the results of the fall, we read from Genesis chapter 3, is that men often don't want to lead as they should. We tend to be spiritually lazy and complacent. We tend to procrastinate in everything, not just in doing your homework or cutting your lawn, but in all that God requires of us. We tend to say, I can do that later. I'll do it tomorrow. A friend this week shared on Facebook, it was one of the sanctifying things I saw on Facebook this week, probably the only one. But anyways, I, I saw this and it said, um, procrastination is the arrogant assumption that God is going to give you tomorrow to do what you should have done today. How about that? Joshua says, there's still work for you to do. There's nations that yet remain. Get out there and do what God has called you to do. So church, let me just say this. Get out there and do what God has called you to do. Be the man of God, the woman of God. Be the husband, be the wife, be the father, be the mother, be the grandparent. Be the Christian that God has called you to be. Go out and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, I'm not a preacher. No, you're a Christian. And you are called to go and make disciples. You are called to stand for Jesus. To share his gospel and his goodness with others around you every day. And notice what God says. I've already cut off many of them. Some of the nations remain, but others I've cut off. Which means God has already poured out so many of his blessings on you. Do you not think he will continue to provide? Over the past month, nine baptisms in this church. I'm going to tell you, it's been good. Guess what, church? We get to have three more next week. Just a little taste there of what God has to come. He is more than able to keep saving souls and changing lives. I don't know about you, but I want to see this place just busting out of the seams on Sunday morning. Amen. And God is able to bring lost people to faith in Christ and to call His people back to commitment to worship Him on the Lord's day. But do you think he's going to do it if we just sit back 
and do nothing? He will bring revival. The question is, is he going to bring it here? Or is he going to bring it somewhere else where God's people will obey him? Which is it going to be? I'm not saying that Jesus will fail to build his church. I'm just asking the question, do we want to be the place where he builds his church? Because he's going to do it. I want to be a part of it. I want to see it happen here. God's arm is not shortened that he cannot save, the psalmist tells us. Which means God is more than able to save souls. If we will go out and share Christ with the lost, he'll bring them in. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. So let's be laborers and get out and do the work that he's called us to do. And we know he will bless that work. Amen? We've seen it. We, we already have seen it. Not, not only in the past few months in our church, but throughout our lives. We've seen the goodness of God. We know he is able. How many of us could share a, a testimony of how God has been so faithful and good and gracious and kind to us throughout our lives? And we know he's able to do it still even today. Verse 5, Joshua says, The Lord your God will push them back before you, and he will drive them out of your sight, and you shall possess their land just as the Lord your God has promised you. If you obey God, he's going to do it. He's promised you these things, and he's going to do it. Verse 6, Therefore, knowing God is sovereign over all things, knowing that he is able to do all these things, having confidence in his power and his abilities. Verse 6, Therefore, be very strong to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left. Now, verse 7, uh, verse 6. He says here in verse 6, you need to be very strong to keep all these things. A lot of people teach and preach from the book of Joshua. We see it in chapter 1. We've seen it throughout the book. We see it here in 23. We'll see it again in chapter 24 when we finish the book. God keeps commanding them, be very strong and very courageous. A lot of people teach and preach the book as if we somehow are the ones who are so strong and courageous on our own. As if we can conjure up this courage and strength. If we'll just, you know, be bold. Now God will make us strong and make us courageous and make us bold, but the strength and the power comes from Him. Not from in here, but from up there. Do you understand the difference? This is like when someone preaches the story of David and Goliath and they say, you need to slay the giants in your life. Let me tell you something, that is not the point of the story of David and Goliath. In fact, that's the very opposite of the point that God is making. Let me tell you what the story of David and Goliath means. God can even use a child to kill a giant because that's how big our God is. The story is not about how strong David is. The story is about how strong David's God is. And David just trusts his God and believes him. And he says, oh, you come at me with your sword and your spear, but I come in the name of the God of Israel. He's not saying, Goliath, I'm more powerful than you. He wasn't. That's the point. That's why God used a child to do it. God is saying, I am so much greater than all the evil and the things that you face. And God is saying that through Joshua here. He's not saying be strong and courageous in your own strength and power. He's saying, I will be with you. I will walk with you. I know you're afraid. I will remove your fear and replace it with confidence and trust and faith in me. So don't try to conjure up your own strength and courage because just honestly, you and I, we don't have any. The reason we can be strong and courageous is because God is sovereign. 
And when we understand that he is in control and he rules and he reigns over the heavens and the earth he created, then we realize, I don't need to be afraid. If God is for us, who can be against us? By the way, I'm preaching that text Wednesday night. If, if you want to hear that one in Romans 8 and 9, so just come Wednesday night. Our trust should be in him. And so he says in verse 6, look, you need to be very strong to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. What is he talking about? Well, that's the Bible up to this point, right? The first five books of the Bible had been written by Moses, and that was the Bible that they had at this point in history. And so he's saying, you need to obey God's word. How does that apply for us today? You need to study God's word and do what it says. It's not just for head knowledge, it's for heart knowledge and it's for how you live every day. So he says, you need to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside neither to the right hand nor to the left. Don't say, well, I, I can do this, it'll be okay. No, no, no. Listen, when you invite sin into your life, when you play around with evil, it will bite you. He's saying, don't, don't think you're going to get away with things. God is good. He also knows how to humble you. Don't take his grace for granted. Don't you turn from his word to the right hand or to the left. Don't you say, well, yeah, I know the Bible says this, but, you know, I, I could do this. No. Don't play that game. Many of us have the spiritual scars to prove that that doesn't work. Amen? Have many of us not learned these lessons the hard way? Okay. So he says, don't turn from God's word to the right hand or to the left. Verse 7. So that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of the names of their gods or swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. Now, I want to explain what's happening here in verse 7. This is not some sort of command in Scripture that you can only marry a person who is of the same skin tone as you. And I say that, and you might say, well, why are you bringing that up? Because throughout history, many have tried to preach this text and others like it as if it is some command that you can only marry someone who has the same skin pigmentation as you. That's not the point of this text. That's not a biblical teaching. And that's really missing the mark here. First off, all the peoples who lived in the land of Canaan, like the Israelites, were all about the same skin color to begin with. They were kind of brown, okay? That's not the point of the text. The Philistines and the Israelites would have looked similar in their, in their ethnic makeup and physical appearance. They would have looked very different by the kind of clothing they wore. I mean, you had a... <laughs> Like, like we see in our culture today. Sometimes you just kind of know where someone is at spiritually by the way that they present themselves. Now, I'm not saying holiness is, comes from wearing nice clothes. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying sometimes people tell you where they're at by the way they, by the way they present themselves. And this was true of the Canaanites. They, they did all kinds of things in worship of their pagan gods. They, they would have looked very wicked in how they presented themselves. And the point is this, that the peoples that God was driving out of the land of Canaan were pagans who worshipped other gods. The command here is like the command in Romans chapter 7, marry only in the Lord. Who should you marry? Who should your children marry? Parents, what are you going to teach your son or your daughter to look for in the man or woman that he or she will marry? Tell them to look for a godly young man or woman to marry. That's number one. Is this young man or young woman godly? Or am I going to unequally yoke myself to an unbeliever and try to raise kids with someone who has no desire 
to raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. I've known far too many people who can speak from personal experience about how big of a mistake it is for a believer to marry an unbeliever. Don't do it. That's the command here, by the way. Remember, this is the same Bible that tells us that Ruth was allowed into the family of Israel. This is the same book of Joshua that told us that Rahab became a part of the family of Israel. By the way, these women, Ruth and Rahab, they were pagan Canaanites who became a part of the family of Israel. The issue is not don't marry someone of a different ethnicity. The issue is don't marry someone of a different faith. If they don't believe, worship, and follow the same God that you do, don't marry them. That is the command here. He says, do not mix with these nations because they're pagans or make mention of the names of their gods. That's the concern, right? If you marry someone who doesn't follow the Lord, who is not a believer in the true God, then you will learn to make mention of their gods and their false religion will be in your home. Don't do that. You will, if you do this, you will make mention of the names of their gods, nor are you to swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. Have nothing to do with these pagan peoples and their false religion. Verse 8, But you shall cling to the Lord your God just as you have done to this day. Verse 9, For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations. And as for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man of you puts to flight a thousand, since it is the Lord your God who fights for you just as he promised you. They're saying, you know, you, you look at the battles that Israel has fought in the book of Joshua. One man able to drive back a thousand. Now, is one guy usually able to fight a thousand people and win on his own? No. But it happened in the book of Joshua. What's the point? God gave you the victory. Obviously, one man was not strong enough to defeat a thousand on his own. That's the point. You were able to do this, verse 10, since the Lord your God is the one who fights for you just as he promised you. So why would you want to take him for granted when he is so good to you? Verse 11, be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. Do you really think you're going to continue to experience his blessings if you are not faithful to him? Now listen, I am not teaching here some kind of health, wealth, and prosperity gospel that if you do these things, God will make your life easy. That's not at all what I'm saying. I am not teaching here some kind of work salvation that if you do these things, God will bless you and you'll get to go to heaven. No, no, no. Jesus paid it all. Jesus secured your eternal life through his perfect life that he lived on your behalf and by the death he died to pay for, to atone for your sins. But here's what I am saying. You cannot mock God and get away with it. If you continue to live in unrepentant sin, God is going to humble you by that sin. Don't think you'll get away with it. You won't. He will give you an opportunity to repent. And if you do not, you will taste the bitter fruit that comes from your sin. Even if you are a believer, he can still humble you. Don't take his grace for granted. Be very careful to love the Lord your God. Now, love, once again, is not a feeling. Love is putting someone before yourself. To love God means to keep him first in your life. This is not about a feeling, okay? We hear the word love and we think, oh, warm feelings. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? Valentine's Day, you know, have warm feelings toward your 
spouse, okay? I encourage it. But, but just understand that's, love is like, it's like when the baby wakes up in the middle of the night and you say, it's okay, honey, I'll, I'll feed him this time. That's love. Amen? Anybody ever raised a little kid before? Okay. All right. That's love. Love is when your spouse has cancer and you're there to care for them throughout the whole thing. Even, God forbid, to their dying breath. That's love. Love's not a feeling. Love is saying, you come first. I'm going to put you before me. And the Bible says we need to love God, which means we got to keep him first. Verse 12, for if you turn back or cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know that for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, but they shall be to you a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish off from the good ground that the Lord your God has given you. Listen, if you disobey God and you entertain this unrepentant sin in your life, it will bite you. So don't do it. Because God can remove his hand of blessing from your life. And all the blessings that you're experiencing, he can. And if you test him, he will remove from you. This is what it means to fear God, brothers and sisters. He is sovereign. And there's nothing that you have that he cannot take away. So don't play games with him. This is serious business. Verse 14. And now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. And you know in your hearts and your souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God has promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. We've seen statements like this already in the book of Joshua. Just a reminder of how good God is. And man, if you can hear that verse or read that verse and there's not something in your heart that just goes, thank you, God. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my children. Thank you for the job that you've provided me so that I can feed my family. Thank you for the fact that I woke up today. Thank you for the fact that, I mean, yes, I may have pains, but it could be so much worse. Thank you that I can walk. Thank you that I can see. Thank you that I can hear. Thank you that I have food. Thank you that I have a church. Thank you for all these blessings you've given me. If you don't hear that and think that way, you don't get it yet. All those things are blessings given to you by the hand of Almighty God. You don't deserve them. He gives them to you because He loves you. When Saul thought he could punish the church and persecute God's people, what did God do? He struck him blind for a few days. What if God struck you blind for a couple days? You think that might humble you? It get my attention. Do you realize that your eyesight, your, your ability to get out of bed and walk around, every breath that you breathe is provided to you and sustained by the gracious hand of God and it can be taken away from you? Verse 15. But just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord your God has given you if you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God. If you disobey God, you will experience his discipline. He will not let you get away with it. That's a promise too. Live in unrepentant sin and his discipline will come and humble you. If 
If you go and you serve other gods and bow down to them, if you do this, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and you shall perish quickly from off the good land that he has given you. So be very careful, church. Let's take this seriously. I want to close this morning with a passage in the New Testament that says basically the same thing in very succinct and powerful words. Listen to this instruction in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, beginning in verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Man, we got to do that this weekend, didn't we? We got to, we got to just be a blessing to a family in our church who are part of this household of faith. Man, that's how we live for Jesus. We do it when we're there in those kind of times. We do it when we share the gospel with the lost. We do it when we love our husband, our wife, our sons, our daughters, our grandchildren. So be very careful to keep his word. He's given us so many blessings. Let's not take them for granted. Let's show our gratitude to the God who has been so gracious to us by being careful to keep his word and walk in his ways. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word in each one here. And Lord God, now as we bring this service to a close, I pray that your spirit would speak to each one of our hearts, that we would each search our hearts. Where are we with you? Lord, if there is one here today, and Lord, I, I don't doubt that there are many here today who've never truly repented of their sin and placed their faith in Jesus, I pray, Lord, that right now, that you would grant them the gift of faith and that man, woman, boy or girl would have the courage to come forward in a moment and make it known before this church that they want to follow Jesus. And Lord, for those, those of us who are of the household of faith, you have warned us and you have encouraged us today. So God, be gracious to us. Help us to keep your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.